These days, it seems like every major tech company either has or is working on a virtual assistant. And really, who can blame them? Researchers and sci-fi buffs have been dreaming of computers we could talk to for decades now, and we're starting to get to the point where these friendly, helpful voices are starting to feel unavoidable. Now the bigger question is, what makes these assistants different? And to find out, we live with each of them for a week. Now, to be clear, we're not looking for the best assistant, whatever that means. Still, as these disembodied voices are becoming almost unavoidable, it's important to understand what they're capable of and how they fit into people's lives. So, with all that said, let's dive in. Of all the virtual assistants we tested, Siri has been around the longest, and it's also one of the only ones on this list that can be male or female. It's due to get a big update with iOS 11 this fall, but the version you can use now is still no slouch. For one, it has excellent voice recognition. It interpreted just about everything we threw at it, and it does a great job of keeping people who aren't you from activating it. In certain situations, Siri will also remember the context of your conversation, so you don't have to go back and ask repetitive questions. Don't expect this all the time, though. And when asking follow-up questions, you often have to press the microphone button instead of saying, hey Siri, as that sometimes restarts the entire conversation. Siri's keen listening skills also mean it's great for placing calls and speaking messages to be sent via text or iMessage. As you'd expect though, Siri defaults to using Apple's own apps whenever possible, so don't expect Google Maps to come to life when you ask Siri for directions. Speaking of which, navigation works great, but the screen sometimes needs to be unlocked in order for it to work. Not the most convenient thing when you're driving and scrambling to unlock the phone. Siri's smarts are pretty hit or miss, however. Sometimes you would be intelligent enough to answer queries like, what's the weather, or how tall is Donald Trump? Other times, though, it would falter on easy questions like, what sound does a cat make, which just brings up Google search results. The nice thing is, Siri enjoys pretty wide developer support, so lots of big name apps play nice with it. Play Overcast. That said, some of our long-running favorites, like Overcast, didn't work at all. Nope. You'll have no trouble posting to Twitter or Facebook with Siri, though. Tweet something. What would you like your tweet to say? Hello, world. Here's your tweet. Siri's reach doesn't just end with apps, either. Thanks to Apple's HomeKit, Siri can tap into a whole host of connected home gizmos, like the Philips Hue rigs we set up for each of our testers. After all these years of work, it's no surprise that Siri feels so well-rounded. Still, until Apple's HomePod launches later this year, Siri is still a strictly phone and watch-centric companion. Then there's Google Assistant, which is just about everywhere. Too bad its capabilities can differ depending on the hardware it's running on. What it can do in a speaker is different from what it can do on an Android phone or an iPhone or even a smartwatch. We tested it primarily on a Google Pixel and Google Home, and while both worked well, using them together sometimes presented some unique challenges. Assistant on the Pixel is powerful once you have your contacts and favorite locations set up. Speech recognition was arguably best in class, and Google had no trouble figuring out complex requests and sentences. Asking Assistant to call and send messages was a breeze too, but that's not a surprise considering how long Google has been working on this stuff. Even better, Google Assistant is great when it comes to answering random, general interest questions and remembering the context of your conversations. Asking it to play it again in reference to a just-ended Spotify track would throw other assistants for a spin, but not this one. It also gave us driving directions to a local store after we asked how to get there, and when we said, how about if I walk there, it followed up appropriately with walking times. Hey Google, play The Story Goes On from Baby the Musical on YouTube on Surecast. Okay, the story goes on baby from YouTube, playing on Chaircast. The Google Home speaker, meanwhile, is great for smart home integrations like Chromecast and controlling your lights, but you can't take notes or set reminders or text friends like you can on an Android phone or watch. Things can actually get hairy if you have a Pixel and Home in close proximity, though, since only one of them will actually complete your request. Sometimes that means the device that can't really help you is the one that gets the command. Okay, Google. Is my lamp on? It looks like the lamp isn't available right now. No matter which device you're using the Assistant with, third-party support is growing. Still, Google's Assistant is at its best if you're already heavily tied into Google's web of services. It's probably safe to say that people didn't really get Amazon's Alexa at first. 
At launch, it was just a voice that lived in a tube called the Echo, but now it's starting to show up in phones and some new form factors. The experience of talking to it changes depending on the hardware you're working with. If it's an Echo, Alexa's listening skills and multiple microphones will probably surprise you with their effectiveness. Alexa, play the playlist Discover Weekly in Spotify. Discover Weekly from Spotify. The situation can get more frustrating if you're talking to Alexa on a phone though, since they're generally not meant to hear commands from across a room. Alexa. Alexa. Either way, it still needs work as a conversational partner. Every once in a while, it's able to remember the context of your conversation. So when we asked it what year JFK was assassinated, it answered correctly, and it also answered correctly when we asked how many kids did he have. John F. Kennedy had four children. These moments of conversational flow are few and far between, but Alexa's chief scientist has said prolonged chats like that are part of the company's long-term plan. Beyond that, Alexa isn't the best at answering general knowledge questions. Sure, it can pull information from web searches and Wikipedia and more, but it's just kind of bad at it. Alexa, how old was Abraham Lincoln when he was shot? Sorry, I'm not sure about that. That's not a huge concern right now though, because Alexa has more than 15,000 skills you can tap into. Think of skills as voice controlled apps. You can ask Alexa to call you an Uber or order a pizza from Domino's or Pizza Hut or to get your smart light bulbs into party mode. And since Alexa is an Amazon creation, you shouldn't be surprised to learn that conversations with it can turn into mini online shopping sprees. Buy me a pair of running shoes. The top search result for pair of running shoes is TFE 630BLKZ underscore men 9.5D Tesla men's lightweight sports running Z series shoe E630Z. It's $26.98 total. Would you like to buy it? No. We've also been testing it on the HTC U11 since that's the smartphone with the best Alexa integration we've seen yet. The thing is, Alexa wasn't designed to be a mobile first companion the way some other assistants on this list were. It's no surprise then that you can't ask it to call or send a text message to somebody. Alexa politely declines and mentions that Amazon's own Alexa manager app can help. Call Christine Velasco. Calling with Alexa is not supported on this device. You can use the Alexa app instead. It's technically right. You can send recorded voice messages or straight up call people as long as they own an Echo or have the Alexa iOS or Android apps installed on their phones. That probably accounts for a decent chunk of people in your phone book, but some people are definitely outside of Alexa's grasp. It's also incapable of launching apps, changing settings, or really doing any of the nitty gritty phone stuff power users enjoy using voice assistants for. Other than that, it's just the same old Alexa on a phone. That means it's great for buying socks online or controlling your connected home from wherever you are. That said, you can only use Alexa in a few markets since it only speaks American English, British English, and German. Microsoft's Cortana was named after a highly sophisticated fictional AI, but in our world, it's mostly just okay. Book a table for two at Tony's Pizza, Friday, 8 p.m. Sorry, I can't help with reservations. It's not really Cortana's fault though. The company that made it has had a lot of trouble building smartphones that people actually want. And as a result, we thought the best way to test it was as an avatar that lived on an Android smartphone. Manga Bookshops, San Francisco, California. I found five places matching manga bookshops around San Francisco, California. Make no mistake, it gets some things right. Cortana was surprisingly good at interpreting our voices, especially when it came to transcribing our commands and taking down messages that we'd send later. More troubling is how long it sometimes took for Cortana to deliver its responses. The delays sometimes drove us batty. Even worse, the third-party app situation seems pretty thin. We're looking at options like Fitbit and OpenTable, along with more prominent brands like Progressive Insurance, Domino's, and iHeartRadio, which are already on every platform anyway. Very little on Cortana's skill list made us think, oh, hey, that'd be useful. And if you were looking to use Cortana to push witty updates to big social services like Twitter and Facebook, well, forget about it. Post new tweet to Twitter. Cortana doesn't do much to get to know you better over time either. 
we had to input information on our preferences into the Cortana app's notebook section. So while the results and suggestions did improve over time, we can't be sure that it wasn't a result of our actions versus the apps. Samsung's Bixby is the newest AI assistant on the block and its young age definitely shows. The company designed the gender ambiguous Bixby to be able to perform more in-depth tasks than other assistants. Sure, you can ask it to show you all the photos you took in Spain, but commands like open YouTube and show me my subscriptions work well too. Open the Google Play Store and install Instagram. Alright, I'm downloading it. Nice. More conventional commands like asking to call contacts and transcribing messages to send to people also work just fine. That is, when Bixby can figure out what you're saying. Take a selfie. What? It's pretty good with Korean, but part of the reason it wasn't initially included on the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus was because it still needed to practice its English. Its ability to listen to you in crowded or noisy places needs improvement too, and that's with a physical Bixby button that you hold down while talking like a walkie-talkie. Samsung's approach to improving Bixby's accuracy over time just may be the most interesting thing about it. Long story short, Bixby is kind of like a character in an RPG. You can give it a thumbs up when it interprets you correctly, and it'll level up itself after gaining enough experience. It's a neat video game style thing, but Bixby really hasn't gotten any better at understanding us. Since Bixby is so new, there isn't much app support yet. In fact, you have to enable most of those third-party integrations in what Samsung calls Bixby Labs. They're essentially beta versions that work most of the time, but neither Samsung nor the app creators agree that they're done yet. Unfortunately, that also means support for smart home gadgets, even though it's made by Samsung's SmartThings division, is half-baked at best. To Samsung's credit though, Bixby is one of the only AI assistants with visual recognition available right now, but even that's hit or miss. Ultimately, we want assistants we can actually trust. And Bixby isn't that just yet. At the end of our week of testing, there was no clear winner, just a lot of different options with different strengths and weaknesses. That's really not a surprise. Every one of these companies jumping into the space have very distinct visions for what they want their assistants to be. That's why Google's assistant is a knowledge graph powered know-it-all and Amazon's Alexa is a shopkeeper dressed up as a concierge. While there are plenty of options, we're not sure that's gonna stay the same forever. Embracing a virtual assistant requires trusting it on some level, not just with your phone, but with your money, with your finances, with the contents of your home. That kind of trust is hard to come by, and these companies get it. That's why no one's going to blame you for taking the time to really understand what these things can do for you. Choosing one of these personalities to enter your life is no small task, so be sure to keep in mind what each of them bring to the table and what they ask of you in return.